All right, good evening and welcome to the TSRA's Early Career Webinar Series, which is sponsored by Atricure. My name is David Blitzer. I'm a resident in the I-6 program at Columbia University, and I'm honored to be moderating the first webinar in this series, in which we'll be discussing robotic cardiac surgery with Dr. Gianluca Torregrosa, a clinical associate of surgery at University of Chicago, and hopefully we'll be joined by Dr. Brittany Zwischenberger, who is an assistant professor of surgery at Duke University shortly. Uh, for those who are watching in the audience, thanks for your attendance. Please submit any questions that you have as the webinar progresses, and I'll do my best to get through them as time allows. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Torregrosa, of course, for his time and for sharing his time and experience with us tonight. Um, I thought it would be best if we started with uh, a brief sort of 10,000 foot overview about your training pathway in general and sort of taking an emphasis on your experience with robotic cardiac surgery and what got you to this point or where you are now. Absolutely. Good evening. Thanks a lot for having me. I want to thank Atricure as well. And uh, this is a great uh, opportunity to discuss a little bit about pathway, about uh, how things evolve in life. You know, I've always been very fascinated by um, reading the story of other people. Biography is one of the major subjects that I like to read because you learn so much about how life progresses for and I would say like I've never really dreamt or I never really thought to become a robotic heart surgeon. It was not like the dream job I would imagine. But then uh, as always life is uh, as Steve Jobs used to say, you know, a connecting dots pathway. You, you do certain steps, uh, you are in a certain place at a certain time and then from there you progress and you, you watch and you navigate through your life and then uh, doors open in front of you and you embrace uh, certain certain areas. And this is as happened to me um, for the robotic uh, aspect of my profession. So uh, I did most of my, my training uh, in uh, uh, Italy at the University of Padova. I did my residency that was a, actually an I-6 program. Um, so directly out of medical school uh, into cardiac surgery. And I was, I was as I was, Telling you before, I was originally trained in uh, pediatric cardiac surgery and congenital together with adult. Uh, soon after that, during my last year of my residency, I decided to take one year to join an incredible program in the middle of Africa uh, that is the Salam Heart Center. It's managed by a big NGO named Emergency, it's like Doctors Without Borders. And there were a lot of heart surgeons, retired heart surgeons that uh, were coming there for two weeks in the middle of Sudan doing congenital and adult heart surgery. And uh, soon after this uh, experience that allowed me really to, to get to know so many old retired surgeons and to scrub with them every day and to learn so many tricks, uh, I applied for a fellowship uh, at Mount Sinai Hospital. And during the fellowship, I spent three years of fellowship there I've been exposed to mitral valve surgery, aortic valve surgery, ROS procedure, coronary artery bypass grafting. That was a very specific time to be in New York because David Adams was the chairman, but um, Dr. John Pascas joined while I was senior fellow, and uh, chief fellow in my last year of fellowship, uh, joined Mount Sinai. And he was the one who brought robotics in Mount Sinai system and was the first time I'd, I'd seen robotics. So now I'm retraining myself because I'm here in the United States. I'm doing this three years program. And I literally like uh, attended the first uh, robotic heart surgery during my last year. Um, the fellow who, Dr. John Pascas just joined Mount Sinai and the fellow who was, uh, did the rotation just before me was the first fellow out of Mount Sinai who uh, did the rotation with John Pascas. And he told me, look, when he does this robotic mid couch this is what Dr. John Pascas uh, uses his uh, robotic skills for. Uh, you don't really need uh, to, uh, to go there, to be there. And this is because he does his surgery, is by his own, he doesn't really do much. So he doesn't really need any help of any young person. So this is, was uh, a um, completely different uh, a completely different momentum because I really told him, uh, look, I cannot, uh, um, sorry, one second. My daughter is here. What happened? I'm alone at, at home without my wife. Sorry. <laughs> no problem, of course. The realities of Zoom. Exactly. This is, 
I, I'm babysitting my four years old daughter and my <laughs> wife is still at work. She's a physician as well. My wife told me I cannot use the word babysitting when uh, it's my own child. <laughs> so I was telling you, the, the fellow before me told me like, actually, like, you know, during this robotic procedure, he doesn't really need much help. He does everything by his own. So instead of, you can just don't scrap. So I disobeyed this, this type of, 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 of rules a bit among fellows. And I decided instead to um, go inside the room. And I made a huge recording of the old steps that he was used to. Uh, to do uh, during his robotic lead catch. And uh, I published a paper together with him and that was the first trig that, that brought me close to the robotic heart surgery. And then I was hired by Mount Sinai and I was an attending for three years doing mostly coronary artery bypass grafting but also mitral valve surgery through a sternotomy and doing a substantial number of robotic coronaries with Dr. John Pascas. We were working every day and we were doing uh, around 100 75 to 100 robotic mid capture per year. And that's where I, I start to have my skills to take down my internal thoracic artery. During the time in which I was at Mount Sinai, I had the chance to meet uh, Dr. Sam Balke, that is my current uh, senior um, partner, and I observed him uh, performing TICA. And you know, as a coronary surgeon, seeing someone that is capable to perform double internal thoracic artery off pump to patients, uh, that can receive this type of surgery. They go home two days after their surgery. There is no risk of wound infection because there is no wound. So um, multi-arterial bypass grafting, uh, complete non-aortic technique, so no risk of stroke. I really believed, I really embraced as a coronary surgeon this type of, 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 of platform. So I asked him to join him and that's what happened two years ago. And I joined him and now it's, it's been two years and I'm almost completing my time with him to complete my training in a cardiac in robotic heart surgery. And he, he really helped me to go through all of the details of a robotic cardiac surgery, not only in, into the coronary business, but also in a robotic uh, mitral, a robotic uh, maze procedure that is an incredible niche and understanding uh, how the robot is the perfect platform to perform a multi-series of a uh, of uh, procedures, not so not only one single procedure, but a platform that allows you to expand your portfolio. Oh, excellent, thank you. So it sounds like you sort of found robotic surgery towards the end of your training, um, and it's still an evolving part of your practice here. Um, Correct, like the stories of every one of us is different, but sure. Something that I've, I've, I've learned and I'm learning a lot and you can learn by, by looking at the, the careers of other robotic surgery, surgeons is that this is not something you should embrace too early in your own career. Uh, you need first to know how to repair a mitral valve before you can sit behind a robotic console and think that you are going to perform a robotic mitral valve surgery. You need to First, know how to perform a sternotomy multi-arterial of pump coronary artery bypass grafting before you can even think to uh, perform a TCAB of pump totally robotic. So you need to be a heart surgeon that has been exposed to a large volume as an independent surgeon, and then decide to join for one or two years, take a time and, and, and join a high volume robotic surgeons to uh, progress and to proceed with you or to complete your finalize your training. Uh, so this is an important skills and this is something that has have been missed uh, back in the days and it's one of the main reason why unfortunately a lot of surgeons have tried robotics, they fail and then they said this is not feasible. We should we should uh, we should abandon it. It's not safe uh, you know because when you try too early and you don't have the right experience, then you can get in a lot of troubles. Sure. So it sounds like you're you're saying, you know, make sure you have those foundational skills that you're fully competent in just sort of more open surgery. Um, and then well, what would you recommend to trainees who, let's say they've got that skill set um, and they want to expand into robotics? What do you think is the best way to venture into that in terms of seeking fellowship, super fellowship? What, what, what would you recommend? Well, I always like, there's a lot of time in which I get to this question. I always ask like, uh, you have to wait to complete your fellowship, your traditional like 
residency and or fellowship program and then you wait two or three years and you practice in a sternotomy phase in a high volume center where you're exposed to the entire portfolio of procedures. And then you can embrace robotic. The way in which you can embrace are mostly like, there are two patterns to do it. One is the way in which I did that. So you, you find a mentor and the mentor has to, uh, so you, you, you basically join as a um, fellow again, almost uh, someone that wants to guide you and as the patient to guide you through the procedures and you join his practice. Another option is you are consolidating a city. You have a robotic inside your hospital because OBGYN or urology use it every day. And then uh, you decide to start with some procedure or start to get some, uh, some exposure to it. The way to embrace it is de definitely uh, you need to have a mentor who comes and is dedicating his time, has to be consistently the same mentor who needs to have privilege in your hospital. And you need to, first of all, go and visit this mentor in his own uh, hospital and not only yourself, but with your entire team because robotic heart surgery is the quintessential team sport. It's not about you and your skills, but it's about the entire portfolio, the entire team skills and ability to work together, to dance together. This is what uh, robotic arm surgery is. So it's extremely crucial and very important that you embrace with this philosophy, robotic heart surgery. And you can do it. You can be successful in your own hospital with a mentor that comes and proctor you for uh, some cases and uh, taking very careful stepwise approaches, thinking that uh, you are going to use the robotic platform it's possible that your efficiency in the number of cases that you're accomplished per single days during the time in which you're learning is not as efficient as when you are through a sternotomy. There should be no frustration, but also there should be no patient harm and no patient responsibility throughout this learning curve. So these are the two pathways. For sure, Perfect. there are a series of habits that are very good for every surgeon and even every trainee, even during your fellowship, you are fascinating by this robotic platform. There is a series of habits that you can try to embrace. And I can give you some of these like five tips that I have. Sure, please. First of all is something that I always uh, found extremely beneficial has been go to other surgeons who are performing robotic surgery within your institution that are not heart surgeons. So let's say that you have your OBGYN or urology, go and spend time with them because you learn a lot of tricks, then they will be very beneficial for you. Mm. Second is that most of the robotic uh, um, platform have a training simulator skills. So the robotic platform itself or the robotic console has a uh, simulator skills that is mounted on the back of the console. So you can sit and perform exercises even during my sternotomy days in which I was not doing robotic uh, consistently, I was spending every day, at least one hour, playing with the robot, doing anastomosis, simulating uh, cardboard games. So oh. events that uh, allow you to maintain proficiency and increase your proficiency with your instruments. Mm -hmm. Third is to try to record every case that you do. When you start to do cases, you have to record every case. And that's extremely important to re-edit those videos by creating your own video, video library. Uh, you, you really can see your progression and you can uh, judge yourself uh, to see how you can speed up, uh, how you can uh, um, correct some, uh, some of the habits that you have. And you can even ask other surgeons to, or more experienced surgeons to review your videos and tell you what do you think about those videos? How can I improve? How can I do better? Mm. And third is to, fourth is to learn from videos of other surgeons. I learn mm. a lot just by, you know, seeing, even when I don't operate, but Sam Balk is operating, it's extremely very important to see uh, his own skills. How does he do it? And, uh, and, and compare uh, on when, when it's my turn to perform the surgery. So it's extremely important to maintain and observe deeply and review every, every video. Mm -hmm. So this is something that you can embrace very early on, even when you are a trainee and you are not exactly embracing heart surgery per se robotically, but it's something that you should embrace very early on. And 
you know, robotic platforms are very readily available in every, in every hospital nowadays because other specialties have embraced way more than us. So uh, it's very simple uh, for, for us as fellow residents or for even uh, young attending to, to get in touch with them and to be exposed to, to their activities. Sure. And then just to, to touch more on some of the sort of programs or when you're looking for mentorship, are there certain things you think you would look for in terms of what types of cases are doing, the volume of cases, just how you're sort of evaluating that? Sure. So traditionally, there are not many fellowships that are dedicated for robotics, but there are right. few in the country in the United States that are definitely deserve attention. You know, there is... Uh, just to name someone, Cleveland Clinic has historical, a great robotic uh, fellowship. Cedar sinai have a very heavily robotic uh, program uh, focused on robotic mitral. So it's, uh, it's something to definitely consider. Emory has a robotic, uh, uh, heavy, robotic mitral as well as a robotic uh, uh, coronaries uh, performing mid fellowship. NYU doesn't have a a fellowship uh, in robotics, but they have a, a very heavily um, platform and uh, um, activity in uh, robotic mitral as well. And then there is University of Chicago where, where I joined. And when, when you join a team, you, you always have to evaluate a couple of things. First of all, uh, you have to try to embrace a program that performs not one single procedure with a robot, but multiple procedures, because this is A, the type of uh, culture that you want to have. So you can see and use the robot to perform different activity. At University of Chicago, we perform robotic uh, congenital, adult congenital robotic cases. We perform, that is not only ASD, is uh, double illet uh, right ventricle. We have done uh, uh, partial pulmonary uh, venous return. So, it's uh, anomaly. So it, there is a lot of potential. We do myocardial bridges and then uh, a, a big number of teacups and a big number of mitrals per year. So first of all, try to find a program that gives you a variety of procedures. Second try, and this is more difficult, but as always in every training program, try to find a program in which the leader is really willing in to teach. This is a complex procedure where the complexity doesn't, is not anymore the central core of the surgery itself. In a robotic mitral, not only the repair is complicated, what is become very complicated is the entire setup that rotate around the mitral, is uh, how do you cannulate, how do you bail out from complication during cannulation, how do you arrest the heart, endo balloon or cross clamp, how do you uh, vent the, the ventricle? How do you de-air? So these maneuvers that are extremely simple in a conventional sternotomy case, how do you wean from cardiopulmonary bypass? All of these steps becomes a complete concerto that uh, are like one or two division standard of complexity above the mean that require the entire full core of, of, of surgeons and, and, and the, the rest of the team. So, you need to make sure that the person who is going to be your mentor is really into uh, accepting a mentee within his own institution and has the understanding that that mentee is not a fresh fellow out of his residency, but is someone who has established and uh, wants to make a step in advance. So he's really willing to help you not to be a table side assistant, but but a, a truly, a, a fully a robotic heart surgeon. I see. So are you saying most of these like fellowship type programs are looking for people who are a few years out from their training and have that, that experience? Yeah, there is not really a restriction for the application to this fellowship. And I'm sure that, you know, if uh, because it's, uh, it's gaining in popularity, robotic heart surgery, but I'm sure that sometimes it might have been difficult for these programs to fill it. The, the spot. So sure. it's always in, in difficult to understand what type of candidate do you have that specific year. And I'm sure that they have accepted also people that uh, came out directly from, uh, from a fellowship. This has been always the case with the traditional fellowship or the most historical fellowship in robotic mitral in this country. 
but then you, you, you want to see how many of those person who have under, uh, uh, under training uh, uh, have been able to succeed, to establish somewhere else a robotic uh, mitral program or a robotic cardiac program. So uh, it's very important to try to um, understand that portion of, of the job. So for sure, my recommendation is to apply to a fellowship like that after you have spent two or three years after your fellowship in, uh, uh, in a busy practice where you, you feel comfortable to perform any type of sternotomy case. Okay, excellent. And so since you kind of briefly touched on it in terms of a job search, once you feel like you're done with your training, um, how did your influence in robotics influence your job search? And how do you think um, people should go about looking for um, it's like at an institutional level and mentorship level, what they should be looking for in a job coming out. That's a very crucial moment because again, uh, because robotic is such a team sport, it's always difficult to find uh, the right job, the right spot and a spot in which you can be successful as a robotic uh, surgeon because a lot has to do with the team around you. So the potential to join a um, hospital that has never had a robotic surgeon before, it's possible, but can be very challenging because at that point means that you have to create an entire team of people around you. And if uh, you're pretty young in your career and this is your first steps or this is your first real job after this fellowship, it might be extremely demanding. For sure, it's easier to work with a senior partner who has a robotic skills and uh, or as a kind of room, maybe he performs a robotic need cut and you can join him and you can bring uh, robotic mitral, you can bring a uh, teacup, you can bring uh, more advanced techniques and together with him uh, building up a, a, a bigger system. So of course it, it, it depends on the type of, uh, of opportunity that you have but if you're joining a hospital that has never had a robotic cardiac program and they call you because they see a, a big potential in uh, attracting more patients in the local area, thanks to a robotic uh, heart surgical program, make sure and be aware that the years in front of you are really challenging. You might still need the help of a proctor and you need to focus a lot of your attention, not only on your skills, but also in building up an entire program. So you have to work so with a table set assistant, scrub tech, scrub nurses, perfusionists, make sure that they get exposed and organize trips to other institutions to see how they work, how, is, how they manage the entire work, how the flow chart inside the operating room, how is the, the entire choreography of a surgery itself. Right. And then you mentioned that uh, while you were at Mount Sinai, they were sort of building that program when you got there. Any other takeaways about building a program besides the, the, those team elements, anything else that you thought were major learning points for what you saw? Yeah, for sure. So uh, these are uh, very important, uh, these are procedure again in which being two surgeons, even if it's not been uh, historically confirmed, but being in two, being two surgeons that are uh, dedicated to this, this team is very important. That's my, my point. Uh, or if it's not true surgeon, you need to have a consistent partner that can be a very skilled and expert physician assistant that helps you in, uh, in this robotic program. Second is that you need to have consistency. So, uh, you know, it's not a, how many robotic surgery do you need under your belt before you feel comfortable. It's more how frequently you need to repeat this type of procedure until when uh, it becomes kind of uh, natural for the entire team uh, uh, perceive this one as, as a normal routine case. And this is what is the real element. So it's very important to maintain consistency. So you can't do a robotic mitral once per month. That's not the type of rate that will make successful any type of program. You need to have consistency. You need to have at least a dedicated time twice per week, at least. That's the minimum to do, particularly in the early beginning, in the early phase. So you need to make sure that uh, 
your chairman is in agreement uh, and, and there is the time dedicated for this. When uh, the OR time is longer because you are passing through your learning curve, the team is passing through its learning curve. There is no judgment from, uh, from your leadership uh, and uh, it, it, there is a, a willing into a higher level of hierarchy to support this type of program. So in its time, it needs uh, 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 from a top to bottom investment into this type of, uh, of program. But the rewards are incredible because there is a huge benefit and there is a huge potential in the, in the future for this, uh, for this niche. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and so I wonder if you'd also just touch a little bit on your experience now in building your practice in your early career. Um, just in general and also in specific to robotics, what you think are sort of the key things that you learned or maybe wish you'd done differently now? Sure, so, uh, you know, I joined uh, robotics as a coronary surgeon, if you want, despite I was at Sina, that is a, a place for uh, very well famous for mitral, but, you know, then the pathway of my life brought me very close to John Paskas and his coronary program, and we were doing a lot of sternotomy cases. So. When you start your own robotic uh, program, you need to understand where is your direction and uh, understand where are your limits. So what type of mitral cases you want to accept, what type of uh, coronary cases uh, you will accept, uh, and how do you want to imagine the choreography for a robotic uh, uh, case? Like is a mid uh, how do you want to take down this internal mammary artery? Uh, is skeletonized, is pedicle, uh, what if I cannot uh, uh, perform this type of case, shy away from redo or complex cases. In the mitral business, let's start with a simple P2 repairs in patients that are highly scrutinized. This is like, you shouldn't start in your first uh, 30 or even 50 cases uh, to do a third time redo complex case. Patients that might be very might benefit a lot from a robotic approach and a right side and a minimal invasive, but that's not the type of case that should be part of your first group. So select your patient, be extremely cautious in the way in which you are building up, be very uh, um, patient yourself with the rest of the team, because in the same way in which you are passing through a learning curve, the team is passing through a learning curve. Make sure that you have a consistency also in the team. Who is your perfusionist? Who is your type side assistant? Uh, who is your scrub nurse? You need to have a team that is crazy and is, uh, there is a repetition. And uh, uh, again, make sure that uh, you, you proceed, you maintain a certain rate of this procedure per, uh, per, uh, per week. Otherwise, you will not succeed into, into this business. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, the, we have seen way too many uh, surgeons who have failed in robotic heart surgery at the point that almost the robotic heart surgery has disappeared from the convention of, of, uh, of the past generation. Now it's coming back with a lot of interest, mostly pushed by the fact that we understand the value of minimal invasive in an era of transcatheter therapy. So we are really embracing minimal invasive in a different way. Mm -hmm. um... And how about working with sort of cardiology and referral patterns or just sort of creating your buzz, your name as a cardiac, robotic cardiac surgeon specifically, you have any? Yeah. So again, it's very important that you're like, you, you create yourself as a name, as a reliable heart surgeon within your institution and within among your colleagues. So the robot should not be the excuse why patients send you cases. The referring physician should know you because you're a reliable coronary surgeon. That's why, and you also offer uh, robotic coronaries or they know you that you are a very good valve surgeon and you know how to repair mitral valve and then they send you a case that uh, for robot and you can accept it and, and consider it to do a robotic. Um, definitely, it's very important uh, to educate your own referring base to what robotic heart surgery is, first of all, because a lot of cardiologists completely ignore what it is, how is it done, and what are the benefits of robotic uh, cardiac surgery. And it's not only for the patients, but for the physician or the referring physician itself as well. 
I'm thinking about the, the, the value of an hybrid approach in uh, uh, coronary surgery, where you perform a Lima to LED robotically, and then the patient receive a, a stent in a non-LED territories. So these are traditionally patients with a intermediate uh, or a medium profile of syntax score mm -hmm. that uh, in most institutions will receive uh, uh, multi-vessel stenting that now they receive uh, a robotic uh, Lima to LED because the referring physician understand the value of a Lima to LED and knows that you can perform it robotically and in a very safe way. So it's very important to build a complete team around you also by referring physician, but not to use the robot as the excuse for sending new cases. You need to be a consolidated surgeon who knows for his value, for his uh, uh, good nature, good, good, good charisma, good technical skills. And this is extremely important in nowadays business. We, you can't be a successful art surgeon if you, if you don't have those social skills and those uh, uh, collegial skills that allow you to, to be a, a good player within uh, the different art teams, you know, valve art teams, coronary art teams, in the different art teams where a cardiac surgeon and the cardiologist have to meet together. Right. So do you, would you recommend sort of shying away from the robot early on and then establishing that reputation in that local community and then working on patient selection or how would you, would you jump right in with robotics? What do you think is the... Yeah, as I told you, I do believe it's very important first to build up uh, your own reputation. At least you come out, you, 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 um, you, you create your own reputation as a surgeon, as someone uh, who is dedicated to this job, is collegial with the rest of the team and uh, is reliable in the type of surgery that's performed has consistent outcome. Of course, like you can't embrace this one too late, but like the too early or too late is a very difficult timing to set. But after three or five years that you are out of fellowship, you should consider it to potentially, that's my suggestion, uh, apply for one of these fellowship and spend a dedicated time of one or two years to uh, uh, in a high volume robotic heart surgical program. And then uh, with the aim to go back in your own community and establish your robotic uh, pro uh, program with, uh, uh, within your own institution. And at that point, with a selective case, selective uh, um, patient selection, you, you can uh, start little by little in a stepwise approach gradually to expand your robotic skills and your robotic referral. Excellent. Thank you. And then I guess uh, my last question would just be if you have your crystal ball, um, where do you see robotics going to? Where do you see the next level of innovation being? Uh, what are you looking forward to? You know, this is a absolutely a crucial, like a philosophical almost question, if you think. Now we are in, in an era where we have seen a change that has been dramatic in our, in our business. And it's not only like, you know, I'm a, a big fan and believer in uh, transcatheter technology for the importance that uh, both Mitral Clip and Tavi has brought within our, uh, our specialities. But in one way, we are paying a price in the same way in which stands at the early 2000, where like CAPG was paying a price respect of stand. It took almost 15 or 20 years five randomized trials of CAPG versus PCI to define a role for CAPG and a role for PCI. Now, in valve history or in valve surgery, we are approaching with the same type of, of, of extreme situation where now every aortic valve stenosis should be treated with a TAB. Now, the last recommendation of the American Art uh, published last week uh, are now indicating as a class uh, one recommendation patients older than 65 years old for a TAVI, even in low risk, despite partner free trial enroll patients 75 or above. So surgeon needs to protect this know-how, this 40 years of knowledge and experience in uh, valve surgery, valve reconstruction, and uh, mm, coronary surgery. And we need to evolve ourselves to the next step. If we don't evolve ourselves, if we don't understand that minimal invasive 
is not uh, in in new newelties in our in our specialities. It's not something new, but it's something that is established. We will not be able to succeed. And mostly we will, a lot of patients who will pay a price because they will receive substantially an inferior type of treatment that is just faster, but does not have the long or medium uh, benefit, long-term benefit of a heart surgery. So robotic has this value. Robotic has the platform from which you can offer mitral valve repair, robotic coronaries, but also other type of procedure and be truly a less invasive surgeon while optimizing and offering the best type of treatment. For mitral valve repair, you offer a treatment that has more than 20 years old outcomes, proven outcomes that are excellent. I'm referring to Tyrone David the paper of mitral valve surgery, because when you think mitral valve robotically uses the same principles, the same elements, the same history and culture of uh, mitral valve surgery that we have developed for sternotomy cases. And it's the same for coronaries. In a moment in which, when you look at the STS registry, in the United States, the use of multi-arterial bypass grafting is less than 10%, where nobody uses bilateral internal thoracic artery because we are all scared to a sternotomy, because we are all scared for wound infection. Probably the future of a big or a large majority of patients with stable coronary artery disease is actually receiving two mammary arteries to the best target of the left uh, coronary system and stands the rest in what we call advanced hybrid approach. So, and all of these can be done robotically, can be done minim in a truly minimal invasive way in which the patient can go home after a couple of days. So, this is a pivotal moment for robotics. The real problem is that the only industry that is behind uh, the only robot currently available that is intuitive has lost a lot, a lot of interest uh, in cardiac surgery. This is, has happened because the previous generation uh, uh, the industry was very um, positive or very supportive of heart surgery but the previous generation has not been so interested in robotics and has not adopted robotics. Now it's our generation that needs to take the baton from those leaders that advance, has advanced cardiac surgery, robotic cardiac surgery to the current stage and try to partner again with Intuitive or maybe with new uh, industries that are coming or facing the, 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 the uh, marketplace with new robotic plus surgical platform and try to really bring robotic cardiac surgery into the uh, well-accepted type of procedure, well-accepted uh, procedures that have, uh, are performed on an everyday basis. So robotic mitral shouldn't be the uh, novelties, but should be the standard for a young patient with a uh, primary or degenerative mitral valve disease. So I see a potential bright future if we keep continually believing in it, if we stop calling a robotic uh, as uh, something new, uh, if we put the dedication and time at the right appropriate moment of our career, and if we can re-engage the uh, attention of industry towards this new generation that is our generation, uh, uh, for, for robotic cardiac surgery. In a moment in which new partners are coming into the market and they might be interesting in uh, trying to find a niche where Intuitive somehow has failed or has not been as successful as he would like to be. Excellent, thank you. I'll just remind anybody else who's listening who has a question that they can submit it um, and we can give people some time for that. But it kind of sounds like what you're saying is uh, robotics isn't only uh, a promising part of cardiac surgery, but almost a critical part moving into the future with that evolution. I, I totally, I truly believe in it. You know, I truly believe that the era of a sternotomy, capstan six, with a big cross clamp through your aorta, you fillet your legs, and I use this expression, this is typical, fillet your legs is an expression by Dr. Sam Balki. I give him his credit, we'll pay the royalties for this sentence. But fillet your leg, to take out two, three, five pieces of veins, and now doing six bypass 
with one artery and, and, and five veins and four veins, it doesn't represent the, what should be the current practice. And not for most, for most patients, I'm sure it has its value. I'm not saying it's dead, but there's a lot of stable coronary artery disease that should be treated with a double mammary artery in a completely off pump, no risk of stroke because you don't touch the ascending aorta. You don't go on cardiopulmonary bypass machine and you can perform the surgery in an extremely elegant way. But to do so, we need a lot of devices, a lot of, uh, of, uh, of uh, technologies that uh, intuitively needs to keep sponsor, including a robotic stabilizer. Uh, we have to embrace uh, distal anastomotic connectors where you can do automatic uh, micro stapling of the left internal thoracic artery to the left anterior descending coronary artery or to the OM. So, in coronaries, I see an incredible bright future. And in mitral, we need more technologies to come and more uh, attention because robotic mitral is, I, I do believe, way better than any sternotomy mitrals. You, the way in which you see the valve is just marvelous. You, you really have an approach to the subvalvular apparatus that is superior than a conventional sternotomy mitral. For sure, it's more challenging because, I, as I was saying before, there is a, the entire corollarium around the procedure it becomes more difficult. The cross clamp, the cardioplegia, the venting, the de-airing, the bleeding. But there is a bright future for it. We need to embrace it. We need to believe in it. And uh, this is a, like a task of our generation. Sure. Yeah, I, I agree. I haven't, haven't been a part of, of many, but I've, having seen videos, I think at least the mitral view is even as just as a teaching tool is excellent absolutely yeah you know there's a, a two more things that we need to talk about in the first is that the respect of 10 or 20 years ago when uh, intuitive came and literally they built up the first da vinci with the idea of creating a platform for heart surgeons to perform coronaries this is was the original the real uh, first uh, uh, engine that that moved intuitive into business was not the prostate was not OBGYN that now represent most of their mark but was heart surgery but at that time first of all there was a generation that never grew up with video games like we did no mm -hmm. second uh, there were not so many educational tools like the one that we have for example there is a company named Mimic Mimic Technology and they produce I I have it in my office is uh, almost like a console, no, not, not bigger than uh, one of those old uh, PC that we, were, we had when we were kids, no? Like yeah. with uh, 386 or 486. Sure. It's, it's just a big suitcase. And you open it and it's portable and you have an entire, you, you wear your 3D glasses and you have, you have the joystick that are exactly the same of Infinity and you can do exercise in, in, your, in your office. I, I use it every day I, I, and I saw an incredible benefit. So you can spend hours and hours of training yourself. We should create a curriculum of training dedicated for surgery, you know, for takedown of the internal thoracic artery or passing stitches in a mitral annulus. So we need to believe more in educational techniques and technologies that, that helps young surgeons to be exposed more to robotic heart surgery. Uh, we're getting some questions in here. I'll ask one from Alexander Brescia. He asks, Dr. Torregrosa, thank you for doing this. What industry competitor is the closest to Intuitive who could take that baton in the robotic cardiac surgery industry? That's an excellent question. That's really the question I would love to, to have an answer for. But <laughs> let's imagine there are at least like three or four companies that are currently coming out uh, uh, into the market. The first uh, is, uh, um, well, the, the big names here is Verb Surgical, that is uh, a consortium in which uh, uh, Johnson & Johnson, Google, and uh, uh, are part of, together with other partners, and uh, they have a huge amount of fund and they are trying to create a robotic platform, a surgical robotic platform. Uh, there is CMR, Cambridge Medical Robotics, and uh, uh, there is Medtronic, who is coming out with a, with a, a robot, and uh, they are uh, literally at the last stages, and uh, they have the approval. 
there is a company made uh, based in China whose uh, 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 director and president uh, is Dr. Srini Bastava, that was a previous heart surgeon at the University of Chicago. So there are different partners and different industries. And you know, if you are an industry and you are coming in a very difficult market like the one of robotic surgery, you don't want to try to compete against the intuitive uh, in prostatectomy because like 90% of the prostatectomy done in the United States are done robotically in 2020. So you need to attack the market from somewhere or a niche of surgery where intuitive somehow has not been able to succeed. And that's historically has been cardiac. So these new companies should really look after the big names in robotic cardiac surgery to try to partner with them and find a perfect uh, robotic platform or designing a very suitable robotic platform. But these one are the big names that currently are uh, about to approach and hit the market. Uh, excellent. And then one more question here from Thomas Stegman. Are there any design issues holding back the increased use of robotic surgery? Yeah, so there were, historically we've always said like that the lack of a perception was extremely challenging in robotic uh, product surgery. So the fact that you are not capable of seeing how much tension you are pulling a tissue or you are pulling a, a suture with. But that's not really the case anymore. The advancement of the vision with the new 3D cameras allow you to develop or to counterbalance your perception with your visual skills. So nowadays I know if I tied enough a stitch or not. And we, we are talking about a 7O or an 8O when we do distal coronary anastomosis. For sure, you know, in terms of design, more than design issues, I would say that there are um, instruments issues, meaning the uh, intuitive has currently suspended the production of uh, the robotic stabilizer. It is an incredible, beautifully designed product that allowed to stabilize the coronary arteries during a robotic theater. And uh, uh, Escula has a huge responsibility in uh, withdrawing from the market the only FDA approved coronary distal anastomotic device uh, named Flex A that uh, helped uh, a lot of patients, hundreds, thousands of patients uh, in having their uh, robotic or minimal invasive uh, bypass surgery. So we need to have more of these technologies available for the current or the next generation of robotic platform. For sure, the extremely dexterity of the robot is one of the big plus. And uh, the type of, 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 of uh, uh, technology we could have are in infinity. Like if you think currently right now, we still have a single clip applier. We should need more, like you should be able to develop, uh, to, to deploy more than one clip uh, with a single instrument. Or you should be able to clean uh, your camera without uh, taking out the entire camera and cleaning outside of the patient's the camera. You should be able to flash your camera and clean it frequently. So these are all technological elements that uh, will be in design that will be extremely beneficial for the next generation of robot and will speed up uh, the, the robotic procedure itself. Excellent. And then actually got one more question in from um, Lubna Bakker. Uh, who asks, do you think that robotic cardiac surgery will be really superior to endoscopic cardiac surgery? You know, I've always, this is, has always been a, a big debate, I will say, but, but it's, it, it's a debate of 1990s, like pass me the curve, but this is a debate of the past, meaning we have always said, what, what is better? No, is there not only mitral or a right minimal invasive, uh, right mini thoracotomy mitral? What is better, robotic mitral or uh, uh, mini, mini mitral uh, thoracotomy mid or robotic mid I, I, you know, I never, and you will never hear me saying that any minimal invasive surgery is not as good as robotic or is not, uh, should not be, be adopted by a team or by a surgeon. But what I truly believe is that uh, the uh, robotic more than any type of other minimal invasive procedure or endoscopic procedure allows you to do not be stuck with a single procedure that you are offering. 
the robot is a platform that allows you to perform different type of procedure. And that is the real advantage of uh, the robotic platform respect of any other minimal invasive or endoscopic surgery. Endoscopic CABG is basically an incredible, challenging, and very uh, basically rarely performed type of surgery. Endoscopic valve surgery instead is embraced by a lot of individual, is embraced by a lot of, uh, of, uh, of team. But the robot allows you to, to have a superior view, allows you to have more dexterities, allows you to engage the entire team that can see it in, in the endoscopic. Most of the time is only the surgeon who sees it. Uh, and, and most importantly, in, in robotics, you can use the robot to perform multiple procedures. That is something that sometimes endoscopic or minimal invasive doesn't allow you to. But it's never one better than the other one. I'm not the type of surgeon that likes this type of, of uh, one versus the other one. I don't think that the robotic is here to replace any sternotomy cases. I'm not, but again, I think that there is a huge part of um, sternotomy cases that can be done minimal invasive. And among the minimal invasive techniques, I truly believe Robotic has a huge role or a huge advantage in respect of others. But if you are a company, if you come from a team who has a competent minimal invasive mind drug, it's a great procedure. You should embrace it, you should learn it. That's very important. Great. And I just actually want to welcome Dr. Zwischenberger who just joined us. Um, so thanks for being here. We have one more question from Hunter Mahaffey that I can pose to both of you. Uh, can you talk about the surgeon's role in driving innovation in the next generation of robotic devices that you discuss? I, Brittany is here. I will let her. Or I guess just not, maybe not any specific devices since uh, yes. she wasn't part of that. But what, well, Dr. Zwischenberger, if you think uh, the cardiac surgeon has a specific role in innovation in robotics? Hello, I didn't Hello. hear the last question, sorry. Dr. Zuschenberger? I'm not sure, she, she might, you might be muted. Let's see. Let me see here. I was trying to avoid this question, as you can see, and yeah, I did it briefly. I'm trying to unmute her here. Let's see if I can. I can try to re reply to this last question. Uh, yeah, well, I try to unmute her. Answer like it. You know, surgeons has an incredible role in driving innovation, and most importantly, in engaging industry to make sure that the industry has clear the fact that uh, not everyone should receive a transcatheter approach for their valve surgery but uh, we should understand which patient can benefit from a TAVI and which patient uh, should benefit from a robotic AVR or which patient should benefit from a minimal invasive AVR. So it, it's very important uh, that we maintain a clear, open-minded towards this technology, but also a very um, dedicated approach and a very strong opinion about the value of a heart surgery and uh, conventional heart surgery in the current scenario of, uh, of a valve disease and coronary artery disease. Again, we have seen in, in, in CABG versus PCI, and it will take another 10 years to see in valve surgery. The reality is that TAVI is not a good solution for every patient. Not every 65 years old should receive or older, like the last guidelines I'm recommending, should receive uh, uh, a, a TAVI. The reality is that our leaders that should uh, be more prone uh, or uh, more uh, verbal about uh, the understanding of which patient should receive, receive which treatment are lacking in, in, in uh, maintaining a, a strong opinion about it. I believe that our generation needs to maintain a, a proper driving force towards innovating heart surgery to the next level embracing also transcatheter approach because it's a huge part of our generation and our and our daily practice. Uh, I love TAVI, we need to do it, but we need to make sure that we, we don't lose or we don't forget how to do valve surgery in the right patient. 
um, transcatheter is, shouldn't be an excuse to forget 30 years of history of bulk surgery. Should be an extra tool that we, we adjunct, uh, we, we, inc we increase our portfolio of technology with. So it's very important that we drive and we maintain a, a focus of attention of industry towards heart surgery and conventional heart surgery. Excellent. Um, I try to give you some time in order to resolve your question. Yeah, I appreciate it. So I'll I, try to speak a little bit longer, but I really don't. Uh, yeah, well, um, we're right around the hour mark. Unfortunately, I can't seem to get Dr. Zwischenberger's. She, she called via phone, and I can't get her phone uh, to be a panelist, actually, which is kind of the limiting factor. Um, See so if we can just get her on this so way she can chime in. I want to yeah. thank everyone who participated in the meantime. Very good yeah, questions. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the open questions were extremely good. And uh, yeah, and we'll. Uh, I, will, uh, I, I will, like, please just join. Uh, 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 just, like make sure that you 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 see the type of procedures that can be done. We, I'm about to submit uh, three videos to CTSnet actually about uh, take down of internal thoracic artery and also robotic AVR just to in, show that, that there's not only mitral into the into the business of robotics, uh, but as Dr. Sam Balki allows us uh, and, and perform on every day, TCAP is one of the most beautiful, bilateral internal thoracic artery, TCAP is one of the most beautiful procedure that uh, can be performed. And we should have a young group of generation of surgeons dedicated to coronary that really wants to embrace this type of procedure. Excellent, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Torregrosa. We have, uh, let's see here. I think Dr. Zwischenberg is on with another account. Let's see if I can make her a look. Let's see. Dr. Zwischenberg? If not. Thanks. Thank you again for doing this. We'll, uh, we'll have this uh, available on our YouTube uh, channel and also a transcript. So maybe we can... Uh, get Dr. Zwischenberger's viewpoint in text if we can't get her on this and uh absolutely yeah. finally I would say I would like to say the last word towards a robotic uh, treatment of atrial fibrillation and I will say that this uh, in, in in form of thanks uh, the sponsor that is Atric here I mean this is a great missing opportunities the best treatment for atrial fibrillation is maze procedure and the best way to perform a maze procedure is uh, to do it robotically. You perform the same, you have the same success rate of an open technique, and you can treat way more patients in a truly minimal invasive approach. So uh, again, if you are sur a surgeon dedicated to atrial fibrillation surgery, this is an incredible tool. The robot allows you to perform maze on, on, on an incredible minimal invasive approach. So there's way more patients that can benefit that or performing a left atrial appendage clip. Uh, or, and that is another incredible tool uh, that uh, we, we definitely under underperform. Uh, with a robotic clip, a patient don't need any anticoagulation. Uh, when, uh, when they take a watchman device, they, they, they need still to maintain a certain uh, month of anticoagulation uh, after the device itself. So it's very important that uh, we know what are uh, the strengths of our profession and we maintain in believing in them and performing them in a truly minimal invasive, I say in a robotic way, but overall in a minimal invasive approach. Great. Looks like we just got Dr. Zwischenberger in, sneak in here. Uh, any quick thoughts for people looking to cardiac robotics and cardiac surgery or um, highlights? Sorry for all the technical snafus. Can you hear me? Yes. Can yes, you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. You can. Yes. Hi. I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. There was just no. um, OR disaster, and then the audio. Anyways, um, thank you for having me. I'm happy to talk to anybody offline. Um, I know that y'all are short on time. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, I'd be happy to answer the questions, and anybody can reach out to me. I can just send you um, responses to your questions. Yeah, I was going to say we'll we'll include we'll have the video up, but we'll also. Uh, maybe publish a text version uh, of this. So maybe we can get you to just give some brief words and then we'll, we'll get that out there for people. Thank you. 
Awesome. Thank you so much. And sorry about all those uh, technical difficulties. Brittany, you left me alone here with David. It was very I'm tough sorry. trying to, to survive this interview. <laughs> I have no doubt that you did it elegantly. Wow. Yes. And you represented everyone well. We missed you. Yeah, okay, we catch you. Uh, with both of you soon. Uh, and thanks again for this opportunity. Yeah, thanks to you both. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Good night.